Uh, it's June 28, 20, 2017. Uh, this is recording for the Lessons of the 60s. We're recording Betty, Garmin, Robinson. We're in Chevrolet, Maryland. Ann Gallivan and Norma Lesser are doing the interviews. Uh, Betty, uh, how did you uh, decide to come to Washington? And what was your first impressions of the city of Washington in the 60s? Well, I came to Washington. I was a member of the SNCC staff, the staff of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. And I, <coughs> I came to Washington specifically to work on a project about school desegregation in the South because I was working on something called what we call federal programs in, with SNCC where we traveled to different parts of the South and collected information about what were the discriminatory patterns of federal programs. <clears throat> so Balt, I mean not Baltimore. Um, so the uh, the Brown versus the Board of Education decision in the fifties uh, actually put uh, the country on notice that school desegregation, that school schooling was uh, in, in unequal, and that school desegregation had to happen. And uh, I can't remember the law, but there was a law that was passed maybe in the early sixties that said that school districts had to comply with desegregation orders and they had several options. One is they could do freedom of choice. Another is they could take all the African-American kids and put them in the white school. They could do everybody in the same first grade, you know, use both schools, whatever the arrangement was. But most of the districts were opting for freedom of choice, which left the onus of combating the, the segregated racist South on the backs of the black parents because they'd have to decide to send their kid to the white school and then they might lose their job, they would be harassed, their family could be um, attacked violently, their children would you know, have to deal with a lot of onslaughts in the school. So <clears throat> we were trying to look at the pattern of what was happening. And what we did actually uh, was we went to the Office of Education. So this is the fall of 65, five. Exactly, and I'm working with Marion Barry, who was the lead person in the uh, Washington SNCC office at the time. So Marion and I go to the Office of Education uh, building, and we ask to see the files, and they let us see all the files from all the districts about what the what what plan each district had for school desegregation. And what we learned was that there was a pattern of using freedom of choice. There was also a pattern of the school districts getting deferments. And the congressmen were very active in using their privilege and their access. And we wrote a report that John Lewis came to DC to deliver, uh, like a 50 page report about all the districts in the South and how they were basically evading the law. So that was why I came to, to DC. And then I just stayed. I worked in the SNCC office until March of 1966. And prior to the time that I left, we had a bus boycott on Benning Road um, <clears throat> which was, and then also there was something called the Free DC Movement, which was connected to uh, department stores, I think hiring African Americans, I can't remember, but it was if you, I, I think it was if you didn't sign on to the Free DC Movement and put the decal in your window, then people would be encouraged to not shop at your store. Mm. So the, all those things were happening at the, at the Washington Snake Office. And then you worked in the peace movement in Washington? Well, first I taught school at a private school in Alexandria, Virginia for a year. I got um, a connected to Topper Carew. And so, let's see, the year 60, 66 summer, I ran a conference on urban affairs. Um, I was just hired to be the logistics person for the conference. And then that fall, I taught school at a private school in Northern Virginia. And then Topper started the new thing, Art and Architecture Center. So I began to work with him, and that would have been in 67, I guess, Six, wait. Yeah, in 67 spring. Mm -hmm. And I got involved in the peace movement a little later on because I worked in the new thing. And then actually we had this group called the Center for Emergency Support, I think it was called, mm -hmm. which was Arthur Waskow and Larry Aronson and Sue Strauss. Mm -hmm. And we, we met at Arthur's house, I can remember, on Wyoming Avenue, and we did a lot of reading 
I think because for me, racial justice is always kind of in the core of the work that I've done. Mm -hmm. So I, what we did was we did a lot of reading about race and about enslavement and, and that kind of thing. And then when the, um, when the, when Dr. King was killed and there was an uprising in DC, we tried to figure out how we could be supportive. So we did some transportation runs. I think we, we carried some food to different places. It's very, one of the things I want to say is for anybody watching this who's involved today, you got to keep notes. Because if you don't keep notes and you get to be my age in your late 70s, you forget the details. So, so it's really good to keep notes. So go back to the new thing. Explain what that was. Okay, is. the new thing Art and Architecture Center was kind of Topper Carew's idea of uh, building an arts uh, base center in the black community and it was in Adams Morgan it was on 18th Street the first building uh, was a, a a storefront building right around Wyoming actually and he had uh, he engaged Melvin Deal who was from the African drummers and dancers uh, we did a storytelling workshop we did uh, there was an artist named Percy Martin I think a black artist who taught uh, painting and <clears throat> and drawing. There was a photography, a guy who named Tom, whose last name I can't remember, who taught photography. So it was kind of an after-school program. Mm -hmm. um, and then we moved up 18th Street. We still had that storefront where we did um, the classes. And we moved up 18th Street to 2335 18th Street, which was actually turned out to be right next door to the Panther office. Although I think by the time the Panthers got active, I was maybe not with the new thing anymore, but I don't remember. And this is the reason you got to keep notes and dates. <laughs> um, so anyway, that was the idea was to uh, encourage young people to use their um, artistic skills and expressions. And it was an exciting time. There were a lot of young people that, that came through the, the new, it was called the new thing for short. And after you left teaching in Alexandria? Well, after I left teaching in Alexandria, that was just for one year. In fact, I got, um, I don't remember if I got rehired or not, but I got critiqued because I talked too much about the Civil Rights Movement. So they told me that. And then the students, actually, it's very interesting, like 10 and 15 years later, the young people, it was I was teaching eighth grade, the young people that I taught wrote that that was the most powerful year in their life because they learned things that they wouldn't have learned otherwise. Mm -hmm. And several of them got involved in different political initiatives. So, But um, I can't remember if I, if I was not invited back or I just decided that I was not going to go back. And then I worked full time at the Art and Architecture Center. I was kind of the administrator and I also taught the storytelling part and the reading. Um, part and I used Sylvia Ashton Warner who was an Australian or a New Zealand educator New Zealand educator who had worked with Aboriginal kids mm -hmm. who had this method of having children use words that were import emotionally important to them and building a vocabulary based on that as opposed to you know Dick and Jane kind of stuff but you know if there was a fire truck or if there was a rat or whatever you would use those words to help them build a story and build their literacy component so so I did that for several years and the peace movement the peace movement okay so let me think um, <laughs> how that came about so I believe what happened is I got a an IPS fellowship for a year or two I can't remember, did they appoint people for a year or two? I think this would have been 70, 71, 72. Mm -hmm. And um, I must have gotten connected. I mean, I certainly participated in all the peace, the huge peace marches, the 1967 one on the Pentagon, the, the Give Peace a Chance one on the mall with the candles, with the moratorium, right? And then I got involved somehow in the mobilization um, against the war. I can't remember what its name was, but somehow I got involved and then I worked with a group of people. Actually, somebody posted something recently on Facebook about the May 1st, 1970 peace something. And I was involved with a group of women by then. Uh, oh, the other thing, oh, I left out was the Conspiracy Collective because the uh, folks who had been arrested in 
1968 for conspiring to disrupt the Democratic Convention. In other words, Tom Hayden, now, uh, Tom Hayden, John Freund, Abby Hoffman, Rennie Davis, Bobby Seale. I'm forgetting the others. John Freund. Yeah, uh, I think Freund. I said Freund. There were eight people anyway. Who Dave Dellinger. Dave Dellinger, exactly. And so I became the link between the the people supporting the doing the trial support in Chicago and and DC and we formed something called the conspiracy collective which and it was my first experience with what a collective was like how did you do that i mean we all came from these you know leader centered kind of organizations and i don't think i did a very good job with this collective because i got criticized at the end of the collective for being too dominant, right? So anyway, that's that we will we'll go there. But I mean, we were all learning how to have a different style of leadership. Mm -hmm. um, so we did one big thing, which was we had a big demonstration at the Watergate mm -hmm. in 19, maybe 69. 70, 69 or 70, or 70, whenever the trial oh, early 70. Or was ending. Yeah, something like that. I remember that. And then there were these people who opened a bookstore at DuPont Circle. Mm -hmm. And we were always very skeptical. We still think that they were agents. Mm -hmm. And one, this is a kind of a story for today too, in terms of, of uh, infiltration into mm -hmm. organizations. There was a guy in one of these meetings who we were planning the, the Watergate mm -hmm. uh, rally. And he said, everybody should put rocks in their pockets and bring rocks. And those of us who were chairing the meeting said, no, we're not, we're not going there. We're not talking about that. Mm -hmm. And then he turned up to be on the police line that day. So we said, oh, my God, that was an un undercover cop. And here he was agitating us to do something that mm -hmm. we were not prepared to do. At least we weren't. I mean, some people were not prepared to do it, speaking about it in public. Uh, I don't think anybody did it that particular day. But. Talk about the wa talk about that um, demonstration at the Watergate. Yes. Yeah. Oh gosh, you're testing my memory, yes. right? So I think we walked from Dupont Circle. We walked down to the big street that goes into the Watergate. It was about 200, 300 people, maybe, and it was a protest against the. Why Why did we pick the Watergate? Is the question. Um, why do help me with this? I can't remember. Was it because Nixon was in office and there well, had something the, oh, to I do? Know. No, it was because the justice, uh, what's his name? Uh, Nixon's, Mitchell. Mitchell lived there. The, uh, John Mitchell. Oh, the, the justice. justice the, the attorney the general. Yeah, 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 the attorney general. general. The attorney general. Right. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, yes, okay, okay. So, so, yeah, that was the connection. So, I don't remember anything special about the demonstration, just that it was. Few oh, people got arrested. Yeah, it good. Okay. Up the, it livened up the whole scene in Washington D.C. Okay, for sure. <laughs> okay. Um, and one one member of our group, Kathy Tackney, oh, uh, yeah, stumbled stumbled when she was looking for a ladies' room. Stumbled into a uh, spooks room <laughs> at oh. Columbia Plaza. A, a whole bank of um, of like microphones and microphones stuff. Microphones and wow. people. Who, you know, she she I don't sort remember of that at all. Okay. fell into it. Right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I do not remember. Nothing that. happened to her, but it was quite yeah, a story. Yeah. Right. Talk so. about, um, you, you work both on a local level and a national level. Talk right. about the nexus between the two and how that um, manifested itself. Well, I think we always, I mean, I think one of the things about the peace movement was the, the lack of base building in the D.C., broader D.C. community, in other words, in the black community. So then there were, there have been critiques over the years about the peace movement being a predominantly white movement. So I think we were always looking for ways to connect the, the war issue with the local black community organizations. I don't know that we were super successful. But I worked locally on, on I also did a, helped to co-teach a curriculum on urban studies at, at Cardoza High School with a guy who was doing it through Antioch. So we were always connected to what was happening in the city and what the, in other words, the, the, the fight for home rule in the city and that kind of thing. But somehow everybody was, remained in their silos. So you didn't have much of, I mean, there was a local anti-war community, but it was mostly young white people who were anti-war and who were, for the most part, we were also, we were, we were in these Marxist study circles that, 
that Ethel and Joe Whitebroad were running. And we were trying to learn and understand about socialism and how that would, would that be a way to change the country? Because I think we were all searching for ways to, to make an impact and to really transform the country. Not that we were successful, because we weren't, <laughs> can you given talk, the times. <laughs> can you talk about the study groups, how prevalent they were, how they were organized? Yeah, I mean, I, I remember them as uh, being multiple study groups, and uh, I, I can't remember a lot about where we did it. Did we do it in people's houses? Did we go? I know we went to Ethel and Joe's house in the suburbs. Mm -hmm. uh, often somebody who the Wellses were involved, uh, Lynn Wells's parents, um, whose name I'm going to, names I'm going to forget, but anyway. Mm -hmm. uh, so there were a lot of old older folks who had been through the the left movements of the 30s and the 40s mm -hmm. and who for one reason or another uh, believed that studying Marxism was important and and found among those of us who were young a ready audience to really delve into some of these texts and to really understand how mm -hmm. the country was working. So again there were many of them. I, I hope somebody else has been able to describe them in more detail because I don't remember a lot of the details. Back to SNCC. Which, yes, okay. Uh, could you explain to our audience what SNCC is, what their goals were? Oh, sure. Locally and nationally. Nationally. Okay, SNCC was the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. It was founded in April of 1960. Uh, it was uh, the students who had uh, organized the sit-ins in the South mostly from historically black colleges, were brought together by Miss Ella Baker, whose alma mater was Shaw University. So she had the foresight, she had been the NAACP director of branches, and she had traveled the South and connected people in rural black communities around issues that they cared about. And when the Montgomery bus boycott happened, she was like, okay, here's the movement, I'm going south. So she went south to work for SCLC and didn't find her. Uh, Did she say who was SCLC? Oh, okay. So she went south to work for the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, which was Dr. King's organization. She didn't find the respect that she should have been afforded given her long history of organizing within the male ministerial circles. So um, she saw, she had the foresight to know that students would be very important to push the envelope forward. And so she brought the students together at Raleigh, uh, April 14th through 16th, uh, 1960, and they founded the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. So one interesting thing about SNCC was they, the students had been doing the sit-ins and then they moved on to the Freedom Rides. And um, when uh, Miss Baker took Bob Moses across the South to meet all these older black uh, people, mostly veterans, returning from the Korean War and the World War II, and they wanted to vote. So Bob went to, Bob Moses went to a SNCC meeting in the fall of 61, and he said, we got to organize around the right to vote. And uh, the SNCC people said, that's not confrontational enough. That's not, that's not going to change the system. We have to keep on doing the direct action. The same, similar debates are happening today about direct action versus digging into communities and doing base building. But, um, but anyway, finally Miss Baker stood, and I don't mean to digress, but Miss Baker is a really important figure in my development and my understanding of organizing. So she stood and she said, well, you, we might want to do both. We might want to do the voter registration and then keep on doing the direct action. And of course, it turned out that once SNCC began to organize and bring people to courthouses to register to vote, registering to vote became direct action because of the repression and the, the jailing and the beating and the, the violence in, in, uh, that was in response to the white Southern establishment thinking that things, things would change. So that was SNCC. And SNCC uh, built a, a network one of the things I did was I went south in uh, March of 64 to join the SNCC staff and I was the northern coordinator, which meant I coordinated all the northern groups which were basically doing support and fundraising. So the Washington office was one of those. We had offices in, in six northern cities and we had friends of SNCC groups around the country and we kept in touch with them and built a base of national support, both money and supplies and demonstrations at courthouses and mm -hmm. 
visibility, newspaper visibility, that kind of thing. And in D.C. particularly? Well, in D.C. particularly, the D.C. SNCC office was a, a lot a part of the um, connecting to the federal government's lack of organizing in the South, and it also did a lot of work around the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party challenge for the 1964 Democratic Convention, although there was an MFDP, a Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party office, uh, at, uh, that worked, mm -hmm. coordinated with the SNCC office. So. Um, I just want you to sort of summarize 50, 50 plus years in the movement, what that's okay. done to you, what you're okay. doing today, if you have any wise words oh, for gosh. anybody. Well, a couple of things. I, went to, I moved to Baltimore in 1972 because based on all of those study groups and everything, we said we have to go to, into the working class. So I went to Baltimore to work in a factory, which I did for eight years got married, had two kids, worked in public health for 17 years. And then in 1997, the, um, I was bitten by the organizing bug more directly. I mean, it, the experience always lives inside of you. So the, for me, the question was, how do I change my life enough to go back to organizing? And I got a job working as the lead organizer for a small nonprofit in Baltimore City that was working in what I now call the wire neighborhoods because everybody knows what the wire neighborhoods looked like, but it was East and West Baltimore where the drug trade was really dominant and people were trying to take their neighborhoods back. So a lot of um, organized neighborhood organizing to um, kind of reclaim the peace and stability of the neighborhoods. And then I did a bunch of different organizing. By then I'm six, almost 65, right? Or I got, a, I got an OSI fellowship to connect people um, across issues and constituencies. The idea being that everybody was in their silo, the housing silo, the education silo, the, uh, the transportation silo, the peace silo. And so the idea was to bring people together and have a conversation about how connected all those things were. <clears throat> and then I did a bunch of other organizing jobs. I worked for a union and so on. And then when the Black Lives Matter movement started, and especially when the Freddie Gray, up, Freddie Gray was killed in Baltimore and the uprising happened, I got connected to this national organization, which is called Showing Up for Racial Justice, which is calling white people in to work for racial justice in the white community, which is actually Going back to what SNCC said in 1966, yeah. SNCC said white people go into the white community. That's where the, that's where the oppression emanates from. That's where things are, we need to change. And we said, oh, no way, go into the white community? We were thinking yeah. southern white community, which some people had tried and were not super successful. There were some people who had some success in, in, in moving some people off of their rigid uh, segregationist stance, but but so I've been working with them in Baltimore. I started a chapter in Baltimore in uh, the fall of sixty of this fall of sixty five, the fall of twenty fifteen, and and that's kind of the work I do now, as as well as hang yeah, out. Yeah, pretty consistent. Hand out with grandchildren. Mm -hmm. Racial justice, basically yeah, everything yeah. you do has had to to do with that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and that's even the D.C. work. Even though I did get involved in the anti-war movement and I did get involved in the women's movement, the DC work was so much about racial justice that that was the you know the, the framework. I have, a, I have another question for you. Um, you were in you went south in '64. Mm -hmm. Did you stay for Mississippi summer? Were you? Part I did. Of that? I you was did. in Mississippi Tell us a little summer. Tell about that. Right. Well, I went in March of '64 to the Atlanta office as the assistant northern coordinator, right? And then for the summer, we moved the SNCC office to Greenwood. And I went with a group of Mississippi, and I went with a group of people to Mississippi to staff the Greenwood office and to uh, stay in touch with all the northern groups during the during this the the summer project. So it was supporting the freedom schools, the community centers, the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party organizing, um, the any 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 incidents that happened, people being jailed, people being beaten, people being stopped from registering to vote. So we did, we had a Watts line, which is kind of like an 800 number of today. Yeah. Um, and the Watts line allowed you to call 
you paid a monthly fee and you were able to call all over the country. So if an incident happened, we called everybody uh, to let them know. We called all the projects every morning, all the projects in actually not just in Mississippi, but in Alabama and Georgia and Arkansas, and collected what happened overnight, put it into something called the Watts Report, which is do well documented in a lot of books about SNCC. So it's something for people to, I mean, I think, just as a word, uh, a closing word, I think learning about the history of SNCC and the base building work that was done in, in black communities in the South is kind of a key to understanding and, and learning the lessons of how do we build a stronger uh, grassroots movement today. Mm -hmm. I'll leave people with that. So. Okay, so one thing I didn't talk about at all was the conference that we organized with North Vietnamese women. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and that's one thing to say about the anti-war movement is there were different perspectives in the anti-war movement. A lot of, some of the perspective was we need to bring the boys home, the troops home. It was very focused on the, the impact of the war on our own communities in the U.S. We had a perspective about the North Vietnamese movement and Ho Chi Minh and what they were doing to build a democratic small d movement in, in North Vietnam. So at one point we got connected with um, the North Vietnamese women and we organized... Through Madame Bin. Pardon? Through Madame Bin. Through Madame Bin, exactly. And we organized a conference of U.S. women in Toronto, I believe, mm -hmm with North Vietnamese women. So we, we did it, Washington, I know Baltimore women went, there were several Baltimore women. Hilda Mason actually went to that conference. Right, right. I don't know if she wrote anything about it, but that would be a great document for, the, right. for your archives. Um, and we met with them and we talked about how we could be more supportive of their struggle to liberate their country and at the same time build something in, in the U.S. that right. would be, you know, at the grassroots And that, or, that organizing of this conference went on across the country. There was a group in Chicago also. Yeah, There was yeah. several groups like ours of a dozen women or something that, like went that, to that studied and worked on it and sent a couple it's people to the conference. fabulous history. I wonder if anybody, that, that seems like a piece of history that hasn't really been written about a well, lot. Well, Women's Strike for Peace was also a big sponsor. They were a big sponsor, yeah. There was a lot of dissension in the organizing. But, yeah, but yeah, sure. it turned out to be a good conference for the people who went. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So there was that piece. There was the the in within the peace movement. The struggle was always: do you do you uh, like at a rally or something? Do you allow a North Vietnamese liberation of of North Vietnam flag at the rally? What what were the politics of the different organizations? And so there was always a lot of conversation about what uh, what are we supporting or not? And then of course Dr. King's statement in '67. Uh, about the big U.S. as the biggest purveyor of violence in the world, and there are four evils in the U.S., poverty, war, poverty, militarism, racism, racism. and materialism. materialism right. uh, so that was kind of a framework, again, for people to be thinking about the anti-war movement and what politics when, I want to mention it. something about that. When he made that speech in 1967 linking the war with violence at home and yes. racism, um, it was a great speech, but he got roundly criticized by every single mm -hmm. newspaper, including the New York Times and the Washington Post, for stepping outside his lane, his, yeah. his silo. You know, yes. he, yeah. he yeah, was exactly. a civil rights guy. They did not want to hear about exactly. spending, military spending, or militarism, or any right. of that exactly. stuff. And exactly. he's been vindicated, of course, and everything he said was yes. true. Yeah. But um, yeah. the, the tremendous forces against him. You, do you have anything to add about the women's movement, your involvement in the women's movement? Uh, I could add something. So I was approached by several women uh, who were in the women's movement. Maybe Marilyn Webb was one of the people. I don't remember who else. Oh, Linda Carcione was yeah. one of the people. And they kept saying to me, you, you have to come to our consciousness raising groups. And I'm like, oh, no, I'm liberated already. I don't need to do that <laughs> stuff. Finally, I went to a consciousness raising group, and I was just uh, I was blown away. Because, of course, it spoke to me, and it spoke to my experiences. And after that, I got involved in both the consciousness-raising groups, and then I lived with a group of women who, um, who were called Those Women, about whom there's a book 
There's a book that details some of that it's called Daring to be Bad. But uh, there was lots of tension within those groups, and many of the women came out as lesbian. Mm -hmm. and, and so that was kind of like one of the, the pieces. I, I personally differed politically with people because I wasn't seeing men as the enemy. I was seeing the, the systemic stuff, the structures, the militarism as the as Can the you way. talk a little bit about um, consciousness raising? Because that's an old term that we haven't heard lately. What, what was a consciousness raising group and why were they so important in the women's movement? Well, they were, they were groups where questions were uh, asked, which enabled women who uh, felt alone, who felt they were the only one that experienced something, mm -hmm. uh, to see that it was a, a universal experience, that other people were connected to the same, had the same thing happen to them, that they felt less than, that they felt um, disrespected, that they felt not listened to. Uh, you know, there's a, a description of uh, men and women in a room and a woman will make a suggestion and it'll kind of, everybody will be quiet, it won't really, and then a man will make the same suggestion five minutes later and everybody's like, wow, that's great, that's a terrific suggestion. That's one example I can remember people using a lot. But, but uh, so they were really an empowering process and I think there are, there are consciousness raising processes that go on today in today's movement both uh, among white people to really unlearn our, our racism and our, you know, we swim in this sea of racism and so how do we unlearn that? Uh, again, not a guilt trip that something's wrong with us, but just that we have all these things we've grown up with, these patterns in, in the external world. And, um, and then for people of color, there's often, uh, how, do you, how, do you, how, do you, how do you learn to unpack your internalized oppression? In other words, those things you, you take into yourself because the system tells you negative things about your particular ethnicity. But those were very powerful processes and uh, brought people into you know, much more um, feeling of, 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 of had much more self-confidence to really mm -hmm. become actors on the stage. And it was a time when women really were serving the coffee and the men were doing the debating and the discussing, you know. I'm fascinated so. with you working in a factory in Baltimore. Okay. Um, <laughs> this was, it's not Washington, but there's no, hardly any factories there, in Washington. That's why I moved to Baltimore, because there weren't any factories. Yeah. So the way I got connected to the factory idea was I had moved to Boston for a year, um, 71, 72, um, and I had a friend, I had some friends who went on the Venceremus Brigade and went to Cuba. And so they came back saying, oh, we have to go to the working class. That's the way we're going to change the country and the factories. And this was a very Marxist turn that the proletariat, turn that the proletariat were the ones who were going to make the revolution and that the proletariat was in the factories and the factories were where the, you know, where you could really uh, exert some power. So, um, this friend of mine in Boston and I actually got a job in Boston in a, in a speaker factory mm -hmm. where we, we wired and soldered Dolby units. And uh, then she had, was friends with some folks in Baltimore who had also been on the brigade and they were starting a collective of people who were going to go and work in factories. So I moved to Baltimore to join them. I wanted to come back to near DC, so I moved to Baltimore because there were factories, there was a working class, white and black working class, and worked in this metal products plant for eight years. So. Did you it, organize inside the factory? Was well, it a union? It factory? was a union shop, it was a machinist union. We tried to organize within the factory to organize like a progressive uh, wing of the union. The union was pretty much um, in the pockets of management. And so we would use the examples of how they didn't fight for a worker who had been fired or a, a worker who got reprimanded. Or through the, through the regular union grievance process, we would fight, but we would also raise bigger questions about the way, you know, privilege was meted out in the factory, the way workers were treated, the way bosses acted, all of those kinds of things. And we would, you know, we had like a little underground newspaper that we published and, and so on. So. Is the factory still in existence? The factory's still there. It was sold in the 70s, I think when the conglomerates started to buy up factories and really bleed 
This was a national phenomenon, which I only became aware of like maybe in the 90s when I read a couple of books. But, but the conglomerate started to buy up factories from the original owners and then would squeeze, the, squeeze everything out of them, run the machinery down, squeeze the profits, and then kind of dump them. So in this particular case, I mean, one thing that was happening is that many of the, that's when the factories started to move south and to move to Mexico and to Asia. But um, this particular factory, uh, there were three plants. One's closed, completely closed. One, the management decided to take it over, and it still exists. And the other chain, it ch has a different name. And I don't really know what, you know, it makes the same products, but it's a smaller example of its former self. So, and in factories in general in Baltimore, about 250,000 industrial jobs were lost between 1970 and 2000. So those were the jobs that people with a high school education could get and have a living wage and feed their families and buy a house and send their kids to school and that kind of thing, and those are completely gone. Um, how did you get involved with SNCC in the first place before DC? Uh, Oh, very good question, very good question. So when I was a senior at Skidmore College in upstate New York in 1960 spring, the sit-ins happened. And I was shocked. I did not believe, because I was, you know, like all of the stuff that's dumped into you about how this is the country of, of liberty and, and democracy and all of that. I'm like, black students can't eat at lunch counters? What? I, I just was amazed that that and so I, I I with some other women at Skidmore organized uh, these big meetings first of all where we debated and discussed what we could do as northern college students and then we had a demonstration at a local Woolworths uh, criticizing the practices in the south of not allowing people to sit at lunch counters so I, I, I was involved in that and I was also involved with the National Student Association which that's a whole other track which because it was CIA infiltrated, that's a no whole other track. I don't know if you want to know that. But, but anyway, um, I worked for NSA for a year, and uh, NSA had been one of the national organizations that had stepped up to support the sit-ins and the black students who were organizing. And uh, then uh, I went to California for, a, for graduate school, and this is interesting, I went around to all of these white radicals in Berkeley and said we have to support the Southern students or the sit-in movement or by then the Freedom Rides were happening because this was 62, 63, right? And they're like, oh, we're too busy. Now what they were busy about, I don't, well, they were doing the HUAC protests and so on. But, yeah, right. but, but so I started a group in Berkeley at the University of California to support the Southern movement. And then I was connected to Jim Foreman and Casey mm -hmm. Hayden and all the folks in SNCC, and they at one point encouraged me to come south. So oh. that, that was the, how that happened. So you have my whole history there, right? <laughs> whole history. Anything you want to say in summary? No, I just, I'll, re I'll, I'll say um, that I think for young people today, they really to learn. Oh, one thing I didn't mention when I was in California, we read the history of social movements in the U.S. We read about every era and what, not just what the movement did, like what the abolitionists did or what the populists did or what the progressives did, but how they organized and what were the methods that they used to make their case and to change policy. So I think for young people today to study all of that, but especially to study the SNCC organizing in the base building. And there's a fabulous website, it's called SNCDigital.org, that the SNCC Legacy Project folks have put together, and it's got incredible stories and, and uh, history and lots and lots of uh, good, good material. So. And would you recommend any books? Um, well, I'm reading this book now by Mark and Paul Engler called This is an Uprising which is a very powerful book talking about how civil resistance is really the way to make change. I mean, what, he, what they're doing is making a case for, there, was a, uh, there were two women that wrote a book before that called Why Civil Resistance Works, and it had to do with, um, they looked at violent versus nonviolent 
uh, revolutionary movements. And their conclusion was that the non-violent revolutionary movements or civil resistance was much more powerful and effective than attempts at violent revolution. And so then Mark and Paul Engler did a, they've written this book um, which is, uh, talks about the civil resistance around the, around the globe as well as in the U.S. It's a pretty interesting book. It, again, if people are thinking organizing and they're trying to think about what do we need to know. I mean, I don't think you can organize on Facebook. Uh, yeah. I think you have to have a, like a depth of knowledge of strategic thinking about how to, right. how to move the issues forward. And, and how, in, how and about that book that, that you uh, participated in recently? Are you going to mention that? Of course I'll mention that. that. It's called Hands on the Freedom Plow, Personal Accounts of Women in SNCC. So there were six women, um, including Judy Richardson, who was here in, in uh, D.C. in the 60s with the Drum and Spear Bookstore. But there were six of us who worked for 15 years to collect. It didn't take us 15 years to collect the stories, but we collected the stories of women who had been participants in SNCC. Um, 52 stories, and it took us 15 years to put the book together, and it came out in 2010. It's now out in paperback, and last fall it became an ebook. So people have access to it. It talks about how we, as young women, got involved in the freedom, the Black Freedom Movement. And, and the name of it again is? It's called Hands on the Freedom Plow: Personal Accounts of Women in SNCC. And one more thing: in your experience, would you recommend leadership? style of management of a movement or collective style of management of a movement? I would say collective style is the key, but you can't rip your leaders apart. I mean, there are people who rise naturally as leaders even within a collective. So that has to be respected and honored and it can be criticized if the person is too heavy handed, but, but I think that there are natural leaders and there are people who have vision and we have to, uh, within a collective process, yeah. you know, understand that those, those people are super valuable. Okay, thank you very oh, much. You're welcome. Thank you again. You're welcome. Interesting, interesting <laughs> pace. Whoa, wow. Even forgetting a lot of stuff, you have a lot of stuff. I know, to talk no, about no, 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 I, yeah, right.